How are you? Good? Yay, that's the way to do it, right. Um, OK. Um, I just have to tell you this. One of the things we're doing at, um, at uh, our new organization is making sure that we're actually capturing the answer to how are you so that we can help improve it. Uh, there's a tremendous synergy in what, um, what's going on at a lot of the, uh, that's sort of at, this, at the bleeding edge in lots of these organizations, which is cool. You know, if you, um, if you read the, if you listen to the news, you would think that we faced uh, just a horrible dilemma in the United States, that what we have to do is either spend more and more and more on health care and then less and less on everything else, or we have to reduce services and expand inequities. You would think that that was just the choice in front of us. But it's not. There's another choice. We can instead increase health care value. We can achieve better health for the money that we spend. So that's where I want to go with this, these, uh, these few minutes. So if you think about it, value in healthcare is created in helping individual patients. Right? It's about that relationship that enables people to achieve better health. So we're looking at the health outcomes achieved for the money spent and the essence of thinking about value is about improving your health outcomes in ways that are more efficient and more holistic. There's nothing controversial about that aspiration anymore. There was 10 years ago, but there's not anything controversial about that now. The question people have is, how? Right? You don't just jump to the end. You don't just decide to do it differently. And it's not the case that if we pay people differently that suddenly the healthcare will be more effective and more holistic. That just, that's not true either. So it's a journey and you'll have to take that journey in steps. And so what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is talk to you about four steps that are sort of the starting points, the enablers for different organizations. They don't go in any particular order, but different organizations will find leverage from one of these, from one of these approaches. Uh, so the first one is to think about measuring results that matter. You just heard Andrea speak about that and about the tremendous leverage that they're getting out of thinking, thinking that way. Measuring results that matter supports the professionalism of your, clinic, of your clinicians. Uh, the, um, God, I hate this. The, um, so what you want to, measuring results that matter supports the professionalism of your clinicians. We've gotten distracted, however, in this country by thinking that it's really about customer service. We're talking about net promoter scores instead of thinking about what do we mean by excellence in healthcare. So first thing to see is that the, what is excellence depends on the purpose of the service. So you hear people talk about Disney service or Ritz-Carlton service, but think about it. What's excellence when you go to a five-star hotel? You want lasting memories. What's excellence when you go to Six Flags? You want a wild ride. Those are both service excellence. What's excellence when you go to your favorite pub or your favorite coffee shop? You want a place to while away the hours. But let me submit that none of that is what you want from your health care. Right? <laughs> service excellence in health care means something different because the purpose of health care is health. And so excellence means achieving excellence, excellent health outcomes. And that's what we have to use to drive if we're going to use measurement as a lever. So I know you're asked to measure way too much stuff now, but the point is to measure a few additional things that are deeply meaningful to your patients and to your clinicians. What we find is that patients, when they're in terms of thinking about what does, how are you, what does that mean, they come up with three categories of answers. And these are the categories that you can think about for thinking about um, 
how do you measure what matters? So the first is capability, functional outcomes. Capability to do the things that matter to the patient. If you're suffering from osteoarthritis, you want to be able to walk. Uh, the second is comfort. Comfort from pain and suffering. So pain, anxiety, depression, relief from those. And the third is calm. Calm that enables life to go on. Most of the diseases that we treat now are chronic and ongoing or end of life or long term. So it matters that you can continue your life during care. How many hours a week are you spending seeking care or getting care? Can you carry on your job? Can the child go to school? Calm. The second area that people sometimes use to get leverage is to think differently about providing solutions. So instead of thinking about providing services or procedures or appointments, about providing solutions in a more holistic way. The way we provide care now is highly fragmented, and it means that it's as if when each patient comes in, we have to make their suit from whole cloth. It's an expensive way to go about things, to have to construct all the pieces for each individual. But that's not the way most of us buy clothes. You can instead have sizes, have care that fits different people's needs. So your solution for a child with asthma, the normal way of pursuing that care, will be very different than your solution for an elderly, frail patient with multiple chronic diseases. And you can think in terms of solutions that fit. And when you're good at those solutions, your ability to personalize and um, make alterations within that size goes up. So by thinking in terms of solutions in a more holistic way, some organizations launch themselves on this journey very effectively. Another approach that people take is to say, let's start by creating real teams, interdisciplinary, standing teams that learn together. So think about it. Is the care that you're providing now care by a team? Or is it actually care by a pickup group that comes together around a particular patient rather than um, working together all the time. The difference is that a team has a shared purpose and shared measures of what success is. They learn together, they develop trust, they develop communication together, and they, um, they improve together over time. So you can drive a lot of improvement and launch yourself on a transformation journey because a standing team will drive change. They will figure out those improvements together. So the fourth step that some places take as a beginning step is to think in terms of human-centered design. It's not the usual first step. Most places first bring together a group of clinicians, doctors and nurses, and ask them how should things be different. But actually, business acumen would say, no, wait a second, you start by first understanding the needs of the people you're going to serve, and then design to better meet those needs. And so human-centered design is um, another approach that people can take to get started. We're going to talk about this in one of the breakout sessions in, um, in much more detail. But the point here is that healthcare needs transformation. In fact, it needs transformation on the order of magnitude that you've seen in your phone service that went from that tethered phone that sat on the kitchen counter and rang when you weren't home to the smartphone in your pocket that helps with all kinds of communications in ways that, uh, that you wouldn't have imagined 15 years ago. But the point I want to make is not just how different it could be or how that new phone is a whole ecosystem of services. The point I want to make is different. It's that when you had that tethered phone on your kitchen counter, you weren't upset that it didn't take pictures of your kids on vacation. <laughs> it's hard to imagine the new services that may come about. So that's the reason for starting from needs and then saying, what, would, what new services would meet those needs more holistically? It's the argument for uh, starting with human-centered design. 
And then that allows your team to see a whole bunch of new possibilities that break down a lot of the barriers that you currently assume have to be there, but actually don't. So if you set the compass on patient health, asking the question, how are you? Rather than set the question on how can we improve and try to answer the question, how are we? You'll direct your journey differently. So the point is to set the compass for patient health and then take steps within your stride. And as long as you stay true to the direction, any of those first steps can help get you past that initial inertia and launched on your journey. Thank you. <laughs>